Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you are having a wonderful day so far because we have a wonderful program for you where we will be talking all hour long with our computer graphics correspondent, uh, Mr. Darius Derek Shani. And, you know, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, you know, some actually, uh, you know, some news from a couple of weeks ago that I really wanted to touch on because, you know, I think it's uh, obviously still relevant in a couple of these stories, but a lot of these are really, really recent stories. So odds are you probably haven't heard, heard of them and odds are you probably haven't heard them from, hey, you know, our resident expert on graphics. So Hey, if you want to follow along, if you want to check out what we do here on Computer America, feel free to head on over to our website at ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything from links to any articles that we do, links to our guest website, and anything else that you maybe want to get away from the show. Hey, we got you in the show notes. And hey, while you're at Computer America, be sure to enter the social media contest brought to you by Logitech. And be sure to check out the live video stream brought to you by OWC. And if you feel like you want to join us in our chat room, uh, interact with us, talk to us, ask questions, or you know, bring up topics, feel free to at twitch.tv forward slash Computer America as well. All right. So all that being said, why don't we go ahead and just jump right into this. So joining us uh, for all of you long-term listeners, this should not be a surprise. And hey, you know, he's one of our favorite correspondents. I definitely don't say that about all of them. Joining us is uh, the one, the only, Mr. Darius Derek Shani. And uh, Darius, how you doing? Welcome back onto Computer America. Hey, as always, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, great, 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 and happy to uh, happy for you to join us. So, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us a quick background on what you do? Because I believe by day uh, you work on projects, you know, in Hollywood and that kind of deal. But you also teach at you know teach at university. What uh, mm-hmm. what are you up to? Yeah, yeah, you pretty much said it. I work on projects. Um, I'll go on set for. Um, for visual effects every now and then, and I'll work on some projects from my home office, and uh, and I teach. Um, right now, this summer, I'm writing uh, an update to my Maya book, which has been kind of dormant for the last couple of years, but I have a new publisher, and that should be out by the end of the year. So that's the major thing this summer. Great, great, great. Yeah, and, uh, and, and you know, just to refresh my memory, uh, who, uh, let's see, Autodesk. That's it. Autodesk makes Maya. Um, That's right. And uh, I mean, just, you know, kind of real quick when you, because you write these books and, you know, not just, uh, not just your students, but also just people in the industry, I guess we'll pick them up from time to time to see what's Mm -hmm. changed, what's new, what's different. Uh, When you do this, do you kind of start from scratch and go, Maya is completely different? Or do you just kind of take what you've written, you know, three, four years ago and say, let's throw out everything that isn't applicable and change what's new. Right. Yeah. It's, it's more, it's more that than anything, uh, because it's already working. It's been in, uh, it's been in print since early 2000, 2003, 2004, and a lot of teachers and a lot of schools use it. So it's got sort of a kind of a proven formula in there. So we don't want to throw it all out. Um, but every, every, other um edition i do change a lot uh mm-hmm. of the book like a bunch of the major exercises things like that will change out um but this this one will will be uh, kind of a nice refresh with a few new exercises but same sort of format as to keep um you know keep the the schools and the classes going about about the same so very very cool so and like i said we have uh you know I'm, I'm glad that you're still doing that and i know writing books it's uh definitely not easy 
and you know glad that you are keeping yourself busy but mm -hmm. we also have a bunch of different topics and these are you know topics that interest you interest myself and they pertain to i guess not just you know computer graphics but also the graphics industry when it comes to you know what's being researched what's being done uh i guess programs that are used things like that uh why don't we go ahead and start with one of your topics that we have here and how about the Adobe one? So Adobe, like, I I guess that most people remember Adobe Flash, and that's really, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the last time, unless you're a creator and you use the Adobe Creative Cloud, Adobe Flash is about the extent that people, you know, kind of remember. But I think I just read an article the other day that said Adobe is one of the newest members of the $10 billion tech uh, companies where... They're mm -hmm. now valued over $10 billion. They're doing better than ever. And I guess there's a reason for that. So what is this Adobe news? And, uh, you know, talk about Adobe's great uh, character animator. Well, the character animator is kind of a, 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 neat, um, a neat product that sort of allows more people to animate pretty easily. I mean, uh, obviously traditional animation, you're doing a lot of drawings, you're doing 24 frames a second or 12 frames a second. Uh, and you're drawing these things and flipping back and forth. And there was a little bit of animation support added into Photoshop where you could flip frames and, and change from frame one to frame two to create motion. Um, now with character animator, this is actually a little bit different than their rebranding of Flash, which is now called Animate, which is more of a motion graphics character animate, uh, or I should say character animator, is uh, more for actual character animation as opposed to motion graphics, moving letters and, and uh, designs around as you would do with Flash or Animate, as it's called now. Character animator actually gives you the ability to animate characters with limbs and eyes and facial features and and things like that so i think it's it's nice to see animation going more um more into the mainstream where people don't have to learn super complicated tools or or do things uh manually i think this is a a really good um it's a good step right i mean that is um i, I mean it's definitely a good thing but where does this fit into the whole, um, I guess, kind of landscape of, uh, you know, content creation? Because I'm seeing here, you know, this is a character animator has been used for uh, Colbert, The Simpsons, things like that. I mean, uh, obviously some big names are using it. Is this something that, you know, is maybe an in-between step between, you know, maybe nothing and full-blown, you know, hire an art studio? And this is just kind of what you use to get something quick and convenient? up and running well i um i think it, it has to come down to how much uh, experience and skill and talent that, that you have because if if you're really that good you can do anything with this tool or any other tool that's that's out there um so i think it'll empower a lot of designers and a lot of people to kind of animate some of their own things without too much uh, hassle or too much learning new things. Um, but I think for, for really big production numbers, um, unless you have that capability, you, you are probably still going to want to hire uh, an expert. Uh, they may still use that program uh, or the programs that you use, but they'll bring a whole new skill set and wisdom and experience to it. So it, it'll make things easier if you want to animate a character for your website or for a look cartoon or anything like that that you're going to put up on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, that's for sure. And I think that's, that's, um, that's great. It, it, it makes it a little bit easier to do more character driven stuff than uh, flash slash animate did. Cause mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, South park style animation, a lot of puppet animation that you could do with flash or, or animate. Uh, but I think this makes things a little bit easier to get more character and emotion, a lot of facial uh, uh, added to your character. I, I mean, you know, and just looking at the animation style, you mentioned, uh, you know, you mentioned South Park, things like that. Uh, one of my favorite is a show called Squidbillies. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. But, I mean, the animation style can seem 
you know, kind of, I don't want to say cheap, but it can seem, I guess, easy and convenient. But, mm-hmm. it, you know, I, I think o- over the seasons, a, you know, a show can really, uh, you know, perfect the technology where maybe it's not as, you know, f- uh, full blown, uh, you know, takes tons of time to create, but they can still milk it for all of its worth and it can still do some pretty interesting experiences with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with the technology that they have. So I'm hoping that, you know, we see a lot more kind of easy animation or at least animation that, uh, you know, is maybe more accessible and more of it then. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, the secret to animation is being able to to draw the, the simulation of movement. So you're drawing 24 or, or 12 pictures a second. What these programs uh, should do and do uh, to some extent is help with that motion. So you're not drawing every single pose for every single frame of your animation. So that's one of the, the, the big things that is in character animator, the, how it can help marry and, and save you the, the hassle of having to, to, to draw. So any good animation program worth its salt for, for the masses well, will give yeah. you that, that opportunity to yeah. kind of in between frames. And you know this is a uh, you know this is a technology that we're hearing more and more about uh, machine learning, and it's something that I think has infested every other area. And I'm not really surprised to see it in art as well. But they said here they use machine learning to you know watch lip movements to do I guess uh, other kinds of motion, and it'll fill in the blanks. It'll you know kind of make yep. it easier for you. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's important to making it more widely accessible to uh, to people. Yep. So, and let's see, this is truly easy. Uh, there's a demo, that kind of thing. Uh, did they mention this is available through, uh, I'm seeing Adobe Max here. Is this available through their Adobe Creative Cloud or? Uh, yes, it should be. From what I understand, it should be part of the uh, Creative Cloud. All right. So, yeah, very, very cool. And obviously, you know, uh, we actually have uh, Adobe Creative Cloud here. And, you know, even just for like an average person, like I know that we have links to, you know, things like GIMP and a couple other, uh, you know, kind of uh, standbys. The Creative Cloud has proven to be a really interesting way to, you know, like if I'm doing something for the show and I want to create, let's say, the title card, that's something pretty simple. But then if I want to do some audio editing, I now have this. Let's see. I, I described it to to uh, to someone recently that I use uh, Adobe um, audio editing software, and it's kind of like using the jaws of life to open up a can of soup. It's like all the tools I have available to me, and I'm still using you know, just kind of scraping by, just getting to what I know. But mm-hmm. it's kind of cool having you know all those tools available if I ever so decide to explore them. So well, absolutely, yeah. I do a lot of even simple video editing with Premiere, which is professional grade. And there's so many things you can do in it. I maybe, you know, touch 10% of it for most of the stuff I do. But once you get, once you get used to that, then you can expand pretty easily into some of the things that you may not use all the time, but the tools are there as opposed to using something like super simple or, or like a free software Mm -hmm. that'll let you edit stuff. But once you want to add, titles or some sort of green screen effect or something like that you you'll find the limitations uh pretty quickly but with with the creative cloud there's um there's no end in sight in the amount of things that you can do right and you know i think we're going to uh switch gears into one of the other topics that is pretty similar Mm -hmm. to this uh, you know, uh, in the same vein that uh, this animator will help you kind of fill in, you know, fill in the blanks, fill in uh, the distance between two frames so that you aren't, you know, it's not so labor intensive. And this has to do with NVIDIA, who's going to be a very popular topic today. But NVIDIA can artificially create slow motion. And although the article claims better than 300,000 uh, FPS camera, I do you know, that is a bold claim, so we'll have to see if that really pans out. But I thought this was interesting because, you know, as far as graphics goes, uh, what Adobe's doing is that they're taking animations, drawing, which is, you know, a pretty complicated thing in its own right because it's not like a set uh, image. It's someone's art that maybe changes shape a lot. 
And they're able to, you know, complete the line between two points. They're able to take your art and, you know, maybe do lip movements and things like that. Mm-hmm. This is going to be, you know, this one here. And if anyone out there is watching the video portion, you can see our guest. You can see Darius and you can see his cat, which is great. Uh, but you could also see the YouTube video that, uh, you know, that they're kind of claiming is using NVIDIA Tesla V100 uh, GPUs to generate extra frames to fill in uh, video gaps. And that's pretty cool too. So what do you think of this technology? Um, is it gimmicky or is, is this applicable you know, to any kind of field? What do you think about this? I think it's incredible, actually. I'm not entirely sure how they do it. And it's a little scary um, that they can do it because they're, they're literally making up frames in between because you're if you're capturing at 30 frames a second, you're not able to get uh, all the information that you would need in a slow motion. You know, if I move my hand from one side of the, the frame to the other mm-hmm. in a certain amount of speed, there's only so many pictures of my hand you have moving across. Now, what they're doing is they're interpolating and they're adding significantly more pictures of the hand moving from one side to the other. Which is um, which is pretty incredible. Um, it's it's definitely doable. It's it's uh, I I would imagine a whole lot of um, uh, warping, um, warping. I don't know if you you know is used a lot in compositing and and effects and things like that. So I'm sure part of it is is warping the existing shapes, but the fact that it knows how to warp and and how to create the frames is pretty incredible and and the video of the racket smashing the little blue gel ball is um is crazy it's absolutely crazy i don't think it's gimmicky i think it's super super useful because if you want to shoot slow motion uh, on a film set you have to run what's called over crank you have to uh, you have to run your camera faster than usual shooting 120 240 480 frames per second to be able to have that slow motion in your edit later on right this will should uh, i don't know how good it's going to be or what kind of artifacting i don't know if it's going to be quite film grade but it could allow you to shoot it just regular 24 frames a second and then get this the slow motion later and not think about it beforehand right yeah and you know uh, just check out the video it's about 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 a minute long we have a link to in the show notes but from what i'm kind of gathering about this when they and the title makes it seem a little bit more dramatic than it actually is where they uh you know the slow motion guys they're probably the premier slow motion uh youtube video content producers out there and they do a lot of things with like balloons and you know whacking jelly with rackets and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, so when the title says "better than a 300,000 FPS camera," that doesn't mean that it turns your iPhone into state-of-the-art equipment. Instead, mm-hmm. it's it takes that 300,000 frames per second camera, and it then uh, you know does that uh, interpolating that you're talking about. It adds frames mm-hmm. in between. And it turns that original footage into something, you know, a little bit smoother. And that's what we're seeing from a 60 frames per second camera, a 30 frames per second camera, a 300,000 frames per second camera. It adds those little in-between shots. And, right, right. It, and, you know, and one thing that I've kind of, uh, or at least I was shown with, when it comes to interpolating, is that you can kind of look at certain areas and see, you know, like if you really keep an eye on it, uh, you'll see, mm-hmm. you'll see, like, uh, let's say a part of an object, and it'll kind of overextend, or it'll disappear yes. in the very next frame. And like, it's very subtle. If it happened in real time, you wouldn't notice it. But mm-hmm. that's the kind of artifact, uh, artifacts you were talking about, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Parts, um, parts of objects will warp unnaturally. Things will disappear uh, behind mm-hmm. other things. Depends on the artifacting. Um, it's still a really really impressive technology but i sincerely doubt uh with with my limited knowledge of it mm-hmm. that it would be better than actually shooting it because nothing's really quite as good 
it, you know, in post as interpolation as if you actually shot it the way you meant to. So right. if you're shooting 300,000 frames per second, you're going to get something pretty incredible. And I think uh, faking it or interpolating it to 300,000 frames per second, you're going to get a lot of trade-offs that if you compare between the two will be pretty um, pretty evident. Um, but, I mean, not to it's, discount what th what this is, it's it's pretty rad. No, no, it, it, it's definitely rad. Yeah. And the uh, the only thing I can say is to you know kind of make it clear, it's it's not that they're taking you know even a 50,000 50, frames per second and saying it's better than a three hundred thousand. It's that they're going to take whatever the the source uh, frame rate is and then mm -hmm. make it a little bit smoother. So you know even though they may bump it up to another you know whatever threshold they want to, if you could shoot that natively that's going to be better. I, I completely agree with you. There's nothing oh, well, that yeah. interpolating can do. But, hey, you know, they showed maybe a slow-mo of a hockey player falling over a net. And, you know, in, in, in its original, it's kind of jittery. And in the NVIDIA, you know, kind of sped-up version, much, mm -hmm. much smoother. That's what they're talking about. It's it's not going to replace high uh, high-frame camera. It's going to make things better looking and yeah and, and i think it would be a really great addition as a filter to uh, uh you know to a premiere right. or some editing package uh, i think that would be pretty rad although i think they're using uh, a few tesla v100 gpus which i don't think a lot of people <laughs> have so i think they've got to they, they got to make it a little bit less uh computationally expensive um to to try to get into the mainstream um I think it's got some limited use in professional uh, editing and, and visual effects, but um, you know, in VFX and in, in big big movies, there's frame by frame scrutiny, and if yeah. any one yeah. little pixel is off, you're fixing it. So I don't <laughs> think it's going to be ready for that quite yet. I don't know if it'll get to that point. I don't know if the interpolation will ever get quite that clean. Um, but certainly I think for consumer and a prosumer as, as filters, I think it will be great to have, uh, I, you know, a better slow motion. I'm surprised that you don't think people would go for the 10, the seven to $10,000 GPU to, uh, to make their films a little bit smoother. I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, I prefer to send my son to college one day. <laughs> <laughs> Others may want a little slow motion, so you'll it's be up to able them. to hand down that Tesla V100 ten years later and go. Here's one year of college, and uh, it cool. will be worthless. So yeah, I, I <laughs> exactly. mean it's uh, but 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 you're right. I think as a filter, uh, they need to get that kind of technology. But it does fold into what we were talking about with Adobe and the character creation. Uh, is that hey, machine learning, and it has the ability to know. And it really, this is what they're doing with machines. They're teaching it that if a balloon is popping, odds are, after watching a million balloons pop, this is what's yep. going to happen next. And that's what's happening. Exactly. Yeah. So, it's crazy. Deep yep. learning is crazy. Yep. Yeah. And uh, a lot of different applications we're seeing. It's not just about uh, predicting outcomes. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I think this does carry over into one of the topics you chose. And... Well, it's about predicting outcomes from computers. So let's see, this one from Science Daily, where a computer program looks five minutes into the future. And, you know, this this has been a topic, and I've seen it phrased a bunch of different ways. One that happened a couple of years ago was to figure out if we're in a simulation. And uh, that idea arose from the fact that we were able to creates a very tiny, 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 you know, uh, not even micrometer, like nanometer sized uh, cubic area mm -hmm. of space. And we were able to replicate everything within that very tiny sliver of space. And we said, hey, maybe we're a simulation. Maybe, you know, future societies were able to do this on a much grander scale. And, you know, it was the idea of what can computers do? What is reality? Blah, blah, blah. I feel like this folds into it, and it's just another question on what can computers do, you know, versus reality. So, yeah, why did this yeah. catch your eye? 
um, because it's one more step forward to uh, Skynet and Terminator <laughs> oh, good. Um, and, and the Matrix, right? You, you know, um, after that machine learning from, uh, I believe it was MIT, uh, used Reddit to train an AI to become a psychopath. Um, I'm afraid it's coming very quickly. It is. I mean, if 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 you really think about it, um, we're we're deep learning. You know, humans, we watch stuff and and we learn. Um, and I think machines are being sort of bred in that in that capacity. I think it's it could be extremely wonderful. Um, in, in this case, with predicting, you know, five minutes into the future, the computer's basically making predictions based on patterns that it recognizes by, you know, st- seeing and studying these things. And we could do much the same thing if we study a pattern long enough. We could say, you know, with gr- greater probability, this is going to happen next after after um, we, observing a, we, a pattern yeah. play out. Yeah, we try to do that to the best of our abilities mm-hmm. every single day. Mm-hmm. When you you know when you drink your morning coffee, you turn on the weather channel and you go, hey, it's gonna rain at 4 p.m. It's like you know that's that's predicting the future and yeah you know, and hey, they're wrong very very often. I mean, I've seen Apple raining like crazy, and my Apple says, sure. hey. Um, and I can't even blame Apple, by the way, it comes from the weather channel. Fun fact. Sure. Uh, yep. Yep. You know, a hundred percent chance of sun. It's like, this is a hard thing to do, but we're trying super hard. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's so many positive uses of this kind of, uh, of computation. Um, but you know, the, the, the cynic in me is also a little bit frightened at, at what it could mean for, for us because, a lot of work, a lot of jobs are being lost or have been lost over the last several decades to automation. You know, uh, robots welding and, and assemblies and things like that. At some point, you know, we're looking at Amazon about to get rid of or or have a, um, a, a technology that could get rid of checkouts mm-hmm. where you just take something off the shelf and it, it puts it on your account and, and that's it. Or you don't need somebody to to check you out. Um, that's 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 concerning in in a few different ways. Obviously, science is going to march forward and progress is going to happen no matter what. But at some point, um, we really need to be careful how we deal with it mm-hmm. and how we we uh, prepare society for those things to be lost. So- yeah, so, so a couple of things. Let me go ahead and let me see the exact date if people are interested. We had an author on. He was the author of um, he was the author of the Fourth Age. Uh, it was he's the CEO of GigaOM, if you remember that publication. Um, yeah, he wrote uh, you know coming of the Fourth Age, robots, automation, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, and he kind of asked a lot of the same questions you did, but he comes at it from a lot of different philosophies, everything from, you know, Aristotle to Harry Potter. And, you know, he, uh, it, it was a lot of fun to talk with him. Just, and luckily he was very optimistic that, uh, that people were going to be okay. But That's hey, you know, th- there's also the situation where people sit around and they think, oh, well, there's nothing left for us to do. But how that relates to computer programs looking into the future, I guess, you know, um, why that kind of matters is, and, and, you know, law enforcement, we've seen it being used with law enforcement where they actually have computer programs. And if you don't think anyone reads your tweets, fun fact, I bet you a robot does. Uh, law, law enforcement uses Twitter and tweets to pinpoint where they should send police officers uh, before they even hit the streets because they're going to know, hey, something might happen in this area because there's a lot of Twitter activity in this area. I mean, this is all kind of precipitated, and this is the point, on the data, on the machine learning we were talking about, the data that we are now creating. Um you know, in the article that you link here, it said that they trained it for four hours on salad videos. Um, right. I, I, I guess, you know, it's, it's very proof of concept. I don't know how you switch from salad videos to something maybe useful, but it shows that they're training it on something and it's probably something easy to, you know, kind of digest at the moment. So 
I mean, right. cool story. Oh, and hey, music just started right there, so it's a pretty good, cool, uh, pretty good spot to kind of say, hey, we're gonna take a break, and we'll be right back. When we come back, um, you know, Darish, we're gonna, I, I guess, we'll let you take a lead. We'll let you pick a story, and we have more, including uh, an Asus motherboard that handles 20 GPUs, uh, gaming disorder recognized by the World Health Organization, and holograms, haptic feedback, folks. We have a lot of topics. Everyone stay tuned. Computer Greece America. is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it. Flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on. We are talking with Darius Derekshani, and we are talking all things graphics and all corollaries related to that. And by the way, folks, if you miss any part of today's program, feel free to check us out wherever podcasts are heard, be that iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spreaker, oh, iHeartRadio, and many, many more. You can find us right there. It's today's show in its entirety rebroadcast. So... With that being said, again, Darius continues on with us. Happy that he could join us. And yeah, we're going to wrap up this uh, this one article about computers looking five minutes into the future. And I guess this is one of those things where it's like, it, you know, you, you mentioned Skynet. But I think it's even kind of beyond what Hollywood of the 1980s could even predict. It's going to be... You know, this isn't going to be, I guess, uh, how to enslave people at first, I hope, but probably more for like healthcare. You know, it's, uh, it, you know, is this patient's uh, vitals reading something? And five minutes into the future, people with these data points usually go into cardiac arrest, have a stroke, what have you. That's probably where it's going to be applied first, I hope. What do you think? That and uh, making salads. Hey, you know, I love a good Caesar. So right. that's great. And uh, man, it, it's like we keep hearing what they're like, they're training, they're trying, they're doing and the research. And it always, um, you know, it really amazes me how almost month over month they're training it to do something that, you know, we had never even thought of. So looking forward to definitely keeping an eye on that one. But as I said, plenty of topics to uh, to jump to and I'll let you go ahead and pick one. Which one were you thinking next? Um, I was thinking about the haptic feedback uh, for, sure. for AR. Uh, haptic feedback is basically getting some sort of uh, tactile uh, response from an action. Like if you're sculpting something, you can really feel the pressure on the clay and the pushback. If you saw Ready Player One, one of one of the 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 goals of of the character was to get this suit mm -hmm. 
and that helped with this haptic feedback for them to feel the things that they're seeing in in their VR world. And I think that's um, that's really cool. I I first became um, aware of haptic devices probably about 10, 11 years ago when they were trying different uh, input devices to co- augment what mice do for oh. artists to, to, to have more of a kind of a, a tactile feedback on what they're sculpting or painting or, or whatever. Not a, not a whole lot of things did come out of that, but it's a no brainer that some sort of haptic feedback would, uh, would accompany a VR or an e- AR experience. So, and, and this, of course, I, I mean, you say 10, 12 years ago, and I could probably one up you on that because I had a Nintendo 64, it, you know, way mm-hmm. back in the day, and it had a rumble pack. It had uh, a well, little, there you go. yeah, yeah. Uh, it had a little thing that would plug into the bottom. Uh, yep. You know, it was, it was bulbous. It was unsightly, but so was the entire console. And, and, you know, uh, let's say someone hit you with a shell in Mario Kart, you, you know, your whole controller would shake and you'd be like, well, there's no doubt that I've been hit by a shell because you feel it. Um, you know, and you know, it's taken a lot of different forms and one of my favorite modern day uses. And I think anyone out there with any kind of modern phone, be it an Apple or, uh, you know, be it an mm-hmm. iPhone or an Android phone. Yep. And yep. like this shocked me. Turn your phone completely off, you know, no input whatsoever. And like the first time I did it, I, on on like I have like an iPhone seven. The first time mm-hmm. I did it, I like pressed the home button and uh, and mm-hmm. like I pressed the home button and I thought the button was was broken. I'm like, uh oh, it's not pressing, it's not clicking down. My home button's broken, and that's haptic feedback, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, I've got it on my phone where where when I'm pressing buttons, it gives a little bit of a vibration every time you you touch the phone. so that's that's haptic feedback and and I think a lot of people are actually much more aware of it um, than they're aware of right. Um, so so you know, it, and I'm sorry, but just real quick. so it gives you the <laughs> sensation of pressing buttons that you aren't really pressing. Uh, it can give you the sensation of, you know, maybe being hit. And that was, you know, way back in the day, where are they hoping to take it with AR? Are they hoping for the ready player one full body suit? Are they looking for, uh, something with your hands? Because I'm seeing some diagrams here. Uh, you know, you, you were talking about, you know, kind of mainstream. I don't think people are going to sign up for an EKG, uh, every time they want to play a game. So. No, no. I, I, I think this is w- way off before it becomes a mainstream sort of thing. But, yeah, that suit in, in Ready Player One, it would be a holy grail for, you know, Xbox and PlayStation and uh, uh, Nintendo. I think that, that would be pretty cool. It would also be a little, you know, scary uh, in some ways. But I think um, that would be consumer you know grade gaming experience along with vr and just uh very recently set up uh, a vive system htc vive for my son and he's playing all sorts of games on on the uh, on the vr mm-hmm. and he's much more engrossed into it uh but i would say he's the same as when he's playing a regular game it's just now he's using his whole body which kind of was the way things were with the Kinect on the on the Xbox 360, where we would be jumping and running and stuff like that in front of the screen. So this would add just another layer of that. Um, if you think like a paintball, if you're playing paintball, you feel it when you get hit with a paintball. Laser tag, not so much, uh, unless you get a little vibration off the sensor that got hit. So this this would bring a whole new level of involvement and and feedback into games, and I think that would be really a holy grail for the gaming industry to get a cost effective uh, suit where you know you're not sticking all these little EKG probes and stuff all over your body, but right. This is just this is just the beginning uh, of these things, um, and there's muscle stimulators in there and all sorts of weird things that eventually I think it would just be a rumble pack mm-hmm. in a vest. Yeah, it it really doesn't take much. I mean, that's yeah. something I think that a lot of people who have not tried VR, 
uh, there was, uh, you know, one of my favorite examples is they put a, uh, you know, a, a plank, you know, that you buy from Home Depot, a wood plank on the floor. And so, you know, maybe half an inch, quarter of an inch, uh, you know, kind of drop or maybe an inch drop to the carpet below. I know people are going to get hurt, but they said, all right, stand on the plank. And they turned the VR on and they put them over a skyscraper. And now they were suddenly walking over a busy city street that they were now, you know, 80 stories high. And like the like just the littlest, like, you know, kind of breeze from, from a fan or a little bit of unsteadiness. Everyone freaked out because it doesn't take much input for your brain to say this is what's really happening. And I think it's the same way with uh, with haptic feedback. It, it, won't, it won't take much. Yes for you know like a little bit of resistance is going to go a long way yeah i mean i i'm constantly playing rainbow six and i know when i'm getting shot from behind you know i see a little indication on the mm -hmm. on the display but if my chair actually vibrated behind <laughs> me i think i i'd be a little bit better at the game because i i would turn around uh rather than you know miss seeing the little compass indicator on the on the damage you know the circle Right. Um, so, I mean, that that would be kind of cool uh, to have. But obviously, that's that's sort of a surface, uh, a very uh, shallow surface, deep sort of uh, use of this thing. I think it could be a lot more eventually go in going into the medical where these suits are, are more of an exoskeleton and will allow people to regain some sort of sensation in parts of their bodies potentially. But, um, right. you know, the. the it's all very exciting what, what this this all means, but it, it all, to me, in, in my cynical sort of outlook, all goes to Terminator, <laughs> you know, uh, cyborgs and, and the Matrix and stuff. So um, it's really interesting watching it uh, uh, come come about. One of the scariest things I saw, and this was on like the it was on like the six o'clock news. It was kind of freaky and at the same time, not completely unexpected. They're using virtual reality to train, uh, you know, ever since the horrible mass shootings in schools across this country, mm -hmm. um, they're training people to respond to school shootings using virtual reality because it's very engrossing. It's, uh, you know, obviously, hey, it's, uh, it's a great tool for putting someone in a situation that you don't mm -hmm. want them put into otherwise. So, but at the same time, it was people wearing a helmet you know, walking around in a, you know, in a square room, empty room, and they had, you know, people jump around the corner with guns. And I think mm -hmm. they were wearing vests that would give you a haptic feedback that you've been shot and told you, hey, don't get shot again. That's a bad thing. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, for law enforcement, you know, in, in a lot of different branches, I can see this being used for, uh, again, realistic, realistic training. Absolutely. Um, I think it was a year ago, possibly two years ago, uh, I saw at the Seagraph convention, um, there's a company that was working on a VR solution for tactical training for uh, military and, and uh, law enforcement. I, I thought that and, was just Rainbow uh, Six Siege. Well, one, one <laughs> of the things that they were working on a year ago, I'm sure it's, it's much better than, than it was one of the things they were working on was a, a faster response rate for having multiple operators in a field and being able to process all that information so that the, the, the avatars that you see in your, in your headset would update in uh, near, if not full, real time for all of the different operators in the field and what they're doing so that it, it is – instant uh, as it should be i mean you want your you don't want your training to to have a a, a lag behind it so i think um the vr is going to be very important in all sorts of training but you said i mean you nailed it where people um where it's going to be dangerous for people i think is a, a big use of vr training yeah right. i think haptic feedback would would just enhance that qu quite a lot Yep. And just real quick, we can roll this over into the next topic as well, where we have, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I, you have a segment here on holograms and it's, you know, very, very similar in the same vein where it's, um, you know, it's, 
another piece of technology that has a lot of different applications, but we have seen the promised land. We have seen the Iron Man uh, holograms in the Marvel movies, but as for what we have and what we have currently, which are generally spinning LEDs that flicker to kind of make an image in 3D space, we are still pretty far away from that. So this article about hologram, have they come any closer? Yeah, I think I think they are. Um, one of the one of the cool things I saw at uh, Disneyland uh, a couple of years ago was they were projecting a, a graphic onto just some steam, some mm-hmm. vapor. That that was uh, that was cool. That was definitely very cool. It was still a one point projection. The projection was coming from one one angle. This um, actually has what what they call a ring of intelligent projectors. I'm not sure what they mean by intelligent, but a ring of projectors that will that will project a different perspective view of the person that you're teleconferencing with. So that when you go around and, and you take a look at that person from different angles, you'll see that part of them, like the, you know, the side or the back or the front. So um, this is n- nothing terribly new. Uh, different projectors and different angles have been used a lot for all sorts of different um, cool projection uh, art installations and, and, and architectural projections and things like that for a long time. Um, but I think what they're kind of hitting on now is getting the, the full projection of the person in real, uh, I should say in full uh, scale mm-hmm. to, to kind of project onto this cylinder i guess um uh, that they're putting it onto so sort of like if you take a a, a film screen and and wrap it around right. a cylinder and you're projecting from you know all around it but all these projections are seamlessly um integrating with one of the with one another so that the front projector and the 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 side projector don't look like they have a seam in between them i think this is one of the um one of the things that's going to make or break how this looks. So I think they're they're using the technology that's there and sort of the methodology that that's there, but maybe you're finding it to a point where it's a, a, a again a near real time teleconferencing tool, so you can see somebody in, in in full scale and be able to to walk around and watch as they shift and move uh, their positions as well. So. Kind of nice to see it be put this way, but it, I don't think it's anything like fully revolutionary as far as technology goes. But it's a very interesting way of using uh, these these things. Right. And just like we've been doing with all the other technology, the way that I can kind of see this being used, um, you know, I think a lot of people were blown away when Tupac Shakur actually performed on stage uh you know rapping and it was the first time since obviously he passed away and mm-hmm. people were like wow that's a hologram rapping and it looks just like him and it's uh you know they created that and i think that's mm-hmm. kind of what uh you know it, it's going to have to be someone special like no offense to steve who's currently in you know on, you know on location in china um steve you're a great dude but I think that this is going to be one of those things that it's going to be set up in maybe, uh, you know, maybe a museum, an art exhibit, something like that, where you could have, you know, like currently we have like the wax museum, things like that. What if you mm-hmm. had a hologram museum where you could have, uh, you know, maybe artists or an actual recording of sure. Stephen Hawking talk to you or an actual recording of, uh, you know, other enter other person of an importance here. And absolutely. You know, you don't have wax, but you have maybe even face-to-face interaction with uh, iRobot-esque kind of questions you can ask it. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it it's um, the whole idea of hologram is, is based on the medium on which you're projecting, and the the Tupac performance was was basically two-dimensional projection. Mm-hmm. Um, this this is still also kind of a two-dimensional projection, right? It's just it's a it's ring just, of projections. It's just that on are a cylinder together to give right. you some some feeling of, of depth. So as far as the sci the sci fi thoughts on uh, holograms, it's not quite there. Sort of like the the hollow deck in in Star Trek Next Generation. So, uh, but but I think this is a nice 
a way to, to, to add more dimensionality to it. To at least uh, But again, I don't yeah. think it's anything that's earth shatteringly new technically. Right. It, it's, uh, it's impressive. I mean, don't get me wrong, but what they're doing is very impressive, but it's not like a new piece of science. <laughs> the only thing that I can say is truly innovate about this whole thing might have to do with this crazy array of projectors that they have set up. I mean, if, if you were, yeah, it's amazing what, what they're getting it to do. Yeah. And you know, if, if you want to talk about consumer ready, this product would not be consumer ready. That's why I was thinking, you know, maybe for events, museums, obviously something very stationary and something very planned, uh, this would probably excel at. So, but Hey, it's, um, it's a step. It's a step. It's cool. Yeah. Right. And it's <laughs> definitely very cool. Very, very cool. So let's go ahead and touch on some of these. We have like 10 more minutes left. So let's uh, try to be a little bit more brief on these. But um, this is one I, I wanted your take on. Uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, as the article mentions here from uh, from Gizmodo, they generally yeah. try to release new uh, you know new hardware details in the spring so that they're available by winter for sale. And I'm generally talking about consumer grade models, not you know things for machine learning or uh, for supercomputers or things like that. But you know a, a new Nvidia GTX uh, 1180 instead of a 1080. Um, but instead of coming out, it's been two years. He came out and said that the next gen GPUs from from Nvidia won't be available for a long time. And I'll get your take on it, but from my point of view, that just means that we won't be getting, you know, the jump from the 980 to the 1080. That was a pretty big shift. It was Pascal. It was uh, an entirely different architecture. Um, I think he's saying that is not going to happen. Like there may be a 1080 Ti X2 or whatever, but what do you think about that? About him saying there's no nothing really planned for the near future? Yeah, I think if anything is coming out uh, soon, it's going to be incremental, like you were mentioning. Um, I don't, I don't mind. <laughs> you know, I'm not in a, <laughs> I'm not in a great rush to to throw eight hundred dollars down, nine hundred dollars down for a new video card when mine is working just fine and I'm probably going to have this for quite a few more years. So um, I'm more uh, I'm more on pins and needles waiting for a new uh, CPU for the new Intel uh, uh, chipset and things to come out so I can upgrade my system. But as far as my video card, I really haven't thought too much about upgrading mine or, or my son's. I mean, we have really good cards to begin with. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't miss well, a beat. As far as new people getting into the market, I think the 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 1080i, the the Ti, the um, the Titan, they're all amazing video cards, and and you can get a Ti for a really good price now that the 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 cryptocurrency boom has sort of um, subsided a little bit. Prices are are no, normal ish again. So I think there's some really great cards already out there, and I, I I'm not a big uh, I'm not going to miss uh, something not coming out very soon, uh, an 1180 or anything like that. So right. it'll just keep my son from wanting a new upgrade <laughs> well, for and, a little and, while longer. And so a couple of things. First, uh, if, if Bitcoin crashes, and let's face it, Bitcoin is a pretty good indicator for cryptocurrency in general. If that crashes, you know, that would be the time to buy graphics cards. Yeah, uh, Admittedly, very well used graphics cards, but... Um, yeah, you know, everyone's going to try to be right. ditching their stock right. because it won't be profitable. But at any rate, yeah. um, the CPUs, though, there, you know, there was news out of Computex last month uh, since you've been on that uh, Intel and AMD both released new CPUs. Uh, I'm, you know, just off the top of my head, Intel released in, I believe it was an 18 core, 36 hyper threaded uh chip no 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 mm -hmm. no 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 it, it was uh i think it was like 50 58 thread it, it was yeah it was, some some something crazy like that what do you uh, think 28 about those? core yeah so 28 core 58 thread and amd had one that was uh similar or if not you know uh one core two core below or above um mm -hmm. they both came out with these things that i just sat there thinking I, you know, in the consumer space, I don't think there's any use for that. So just real quick, what do you think about those? Um, 
I want one. <laughs> I think it'll speed up my work. Uh, but I do a lot of multi-core rendering and things like that. Consumer space games, you know, they don't they don't take um, they don't universally take advantage of multi uh, multiple cores that well yet. So um, I think I don't think it's it's consumer grade. I mean, twenty eight cores that's definitely that's prosumer at the very least, if not. But it's on. not even and and but to my point, like it's not even prosumer. Like uh, you know, I I, I kind of got the uh, you know the ten core, the sixteen core. If you are you know if you if you live stream your video games and you do a bunch of different things and also you upload video and you you know and or you have all this kind of stuff. Like maybe, and that gives you plenty of headroom with what was available, you know, kind mm-hmm. of the, you know, the revamped Xeon processors that they were putting out. I feel like this is them just kind of flexing their muscles going, check out what we can do. And yeah, I, yeah. I, I think to some point, I mean, there's, there's also a little bit of limitation on how fast the, the core clock can go, you know, as far as gigahertz and speed. So um, parallel computing, once the OS and, and software really embraces it, the, the future is really in parallel computing, like we're seeing with the CUDA cores and the amount of GPU tasking you can do. It's, it's a lot more efficient because it has so many more cores than your CPU has. Right. So I think as far as CPUs, I, I, I do get it. I think multiple cores are definitely a way to go. Especially because that that gigahertz barrier, not barrier, but the the the, the trade off speed, yeah, it there, it, it's only going to go so much fast uh, before you start getting into quantum computing and really, really intrinsically changing the fundamentals of well, of computing. That, I think yeah. um, you know, twenty thirty years ago, when I was in 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 college, thirty years ago, um, there was a lot of uh, talk about parallel processing and your brain is a parallel processor uh and i think it's taken a very long time for things to embrace this sort of multiple processor way of doing things and i think software still needs to to get better at it i know there's a lot of functions in in my 3ds max that are still kind of single threaded and everything just kind of comes to a crawl and depends on the clock speed, which for me is at four gigahertz right now. So um, there, there are plenty of things that only hit up one or two cores. I think once everything embraces multi cores better, the value of a of a chip like this will become much more evident. But I don't think it, we're quite there yet, where we need that many cores. That's why I was saying prosumer or professional. That's when you're doing a lot of video rendering and, and right. 3D rendering and, and things like that. That the more you have, the better. That that's what I was getting at. And, and a couple of things. First of all, uh, you're still in college. Second of all, um, let's see. Uh, second of all, like I, I I completely agree with you. But a lot of the software that's written nowadays, uh, you know, you mentioned like your rendering software that is written at its very base level to utilize as many cores as, as it'll take. Um, but at the same time, a lot of uh, everyday programs like computer games or web browsers or just everything that people use on a daily basis, they're mm-hmm. not written. Like everything's going to have right. to be rewritten. And I think that now that people have, like, you know, before with uh, Intel dominating the space and AMD kind of playing catch up, um, the most you could kind of hope for a person having was eight cores. Um, right. And, you know, before that, four cores was more likely, two cores was common. Um, you know, and if you're a developer, why waste the time and energy to develop something that runs on 30, uh, on 30 different threads? Um, I guess once the, soft, once the hardware gets out there, maybe more developers would be more willing to write things that take advantage of 20, 30, 40, 50 cores or threads. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, maybe. I do hope so. Yep. So anyways, uh, there's music playing in the background, Darius. We did not get to a couple of these. Maybe next time you come on, we can talk no, about this gaming disorder. Sounds great. Um, I know that you're big into gaming and so am I. So maybe next time. But, uh, but Darius, real quick, what's going on? Uh, I believe Koosh 3D is still your Twitter uh, Twitter handle. What's, uh, what's That's happening right. with you? That's right. Um, just finishing up my book this summer. I've got a, a video on Pluralsight.com. It should hopefully be, it's been delayed, but should hopefully be live. And that's a, a course on V-Ray rendering that should be going up. So 
you're interested in learning how to, to render with V-Ray, that's a great video to check out. And All that's right. pluralsight.com. All right, very cool. And we'll be sure to include that in the show notes. And Darius, until next month, thank you so much and, uh, and have thank a great you. day. You as well. Take care. All right, take care. And everyone else out there, thank you for tuning into Computer America. It's been a, been a lot of fun. Thank you for uh, checking us out. And be sure to check out the podcast version of the show if you missed any part of it. Tune in tomorrow. Hey, you know here. Be sure to tune in tomorrow as we have our all Linux program with Marcel Gagné. It's uh, always a fun time when we focus on Linux. He's a, you know, he's a great, great, great correspondent. Everyone, catch you next time.